Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I'm just going to give everyone a few more seconds to log in, inshallah, and then we will start the program. Okay, let's begin, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Sarah, and I will be your host for today's session of the Back to School series. Today's topic is a parent's journey of navigating a child's social anxiety. So before we begin, I would like to do something a little different for this session. Uh, we are going to do a virtual scavenger hunt. Since this is the Back to School series, we will be collecting items that relate to school. Um, I will list each item and give everyone a few seconds to collect them. Once you have all the items, you can take a picture and post it in the comments. And the first one to post it up wins a Tim Hortons gift card, inshallah. Uh, so let's get started. Um, one second. Oh, wait. Uh, the first uh, item is a basic tool that every student needs for class, a pencil. So I'll give everyone 15 seconds to grab a pencil. I'll count to 15. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So inshallah, the second item is a sharpener. So if everyone can grab a sharpener, uh, that would be great. 15 seconds to grab a sharpener. So 15 seconds, so five seconds left. If you have a sharpener, please grab one. Uh, the third item is a notebook. So I'll give everyone 15 seconds to grab a notebook, inshallah. Uh, the fourth item is an eraser. So if you have any erasers, just grab one. Any eraser will do. And the... 15 seconds for that. Okay, and the final item is a ruler. So 15 seconds to grab your rulers, inshallah. So once you guys collected all of the items, you can take a picture and post it in the comment section and we will be announcing the winner within 24 to 48 hours, inshallah. So stay tuned for that. So now that you guys have your notebook and pencil at hand, it is time to start today's session. We will be starting this session with a Quran recitation by a young sister, um, Azelfa Chowdhury. Azelfa is currently a grade seven student and the, um, at the Calgary Islamic School. She has memorized a large portion of the Quran and enjoys taking part in many Islamic programs in her school. Azelfa, please take the mic. عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر 
سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم He is Allah other than whom there is no deity nor of the unseen, the witness He is entirely merciful, the especially merciful He is Allah other than whom there is no deity the sovereign, the pure, the perfection, the bestower of faith, the overseer, the exalted in might, the compu- the compiler, the superior, exalted is Allah above whatever they associate associate with him. He is Allah, the creator, the inventor, the fashioner. To him belong the best names. Whatever is in the heavens and the earth is, is exalting him. And he is exalted in might, the wise. Thank you, Sister Zalfa, for that beautiful recitation, mashallah. Uh, now I will be introducing our speaker for today. So if you have any questions at the end of the talk, please leave them in the comment section and we will ask your questions, inshallah. So our speaker for today is Sister Maliha Ahmed. Maliha Ahmed is a successful entrepreneur and founder of Too Much Mama. She is a mother of two children who are homeschooled. She is passionate about supporting the unique learning of children and run camps for children. Uh, She recently ran a very well-received Data Excel camp for kids ages seven seven to 14. Through her own research and application experiences, she is well-versed and trained in how children learn differently and has comprehensive knowledge around how to support children with special needs when it comes to developing their social, emotional, and self-regulation skills. So, uh, So without further ado, Sister Maliha. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. I'm so excited to be here with all of you today. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa hlul uqtatam min lisani yafqahu qawli. Rabbana zidna ilma. Ameen. So I'm really excited to be here. Alhamdulillah, and I love that beautiful Quran recitation, mashallah. And um, I wanted to say a few housekeeping things before getting started. So keep in mind, I can't see you or your comments, but feel free to put them down uh, as you're thinking about things. And inshallah, we will have a Q&A after the talk as well. I wish I could see you, but I can't. So inshallah, I'm going to dive right in. And today we are going to be talking about our journey with navigating social anxiety as well as anxiety in general. So our journey as parents as well as for our kids, how our journey ties in with anxiety, what anxiety looks like, feels like, sounds like, because kids don't always come to you saying you're they're worried or they're feeling anxious. They can say a lot of different things or act in a lot of different ways and anxiety can show up in a variety of ways. We'll also talk about today what's happening in the brain when we're feeling anxious. So this goes for us and our children. Where do we go from here? Now that we're learning all this information, what do we do with it? I'll talk a little bit about the lessons from the Quran as well as some duas uh, that have helped us personally in our journey, alhamdulillah. And I'll be ending with tools, strategies, and resources that you can use and apply in your home, inshallah. So I'll start talking about our journey. I'm going to start off with a story. So this goes back to several, several years ago. I was at a work meeting and I was facilitating and presenting at this meeting and I had missed a call from my son's preschool teacher. So during a break, I looked at my phone and I heard the message. She had left a voicemail saying my son was you know, not interacting with other kids and she wanted to talk to, uh, to us and she had something concerning to say. So I called her back and she was concerned. My son would play independently, wouldn't be playing with other kids. He was very, very little, maybe only three years old. 
and she was concerned when she saw that and that uh, took us on a very very long journey if you know us today and you know my son today you know that that's not true for him anymore alhamdulillah so we've had a long journey we have used some of the skills i will be talking about today so what you see is a graph so i don't want to scare you off i will try not to make this very academic but i wanted to share where we started our journey with anxiety and how we got to know anxiety as closely as we do now so what you see here is a graph this is called a bell curve it looks like a bell what what we see here is most people with their iq i'm talking about iq fall there right in the middle of the graph and that's where you see the blue the blue in the graph um that's about an iq of 100 that's an average iq anything between 100 to 130 is uh considered above average 130 is uh, the gifted iq and it's the optimal gifted IQ that falls somewhere in this blue and red range. Once you start going beyond the blue and red range into the orange range at the very end of the bell curve, you get a child or an adult even who experiences life very, very differently from the norm. So their, their life experience is very different, which also means they have significantly different needs doesn't matter if they're gifted and on the right end of the bell curve or if they're on the left end of the bell curve and struggling with some things. They basically experience uh, the feelings of being an outsider. So why is this bell curve important? Why is this graph important? We figured, we what we understood was that some my son was somewhere on the very, very, very end in the orange side on the right side. What we now also know is that developmentally advanced children or even even children who are developmentally delayed are at risk in a society that prizes sameness or, or being the same. So this starts really before your kids are even born. Uh, and when they're born, it starts. So, you know, at age zero to three months, these are the milestones you you're, uh, should be looking for. And if you don't see them, there's a red flag. Three to six months, there is another set of milestones. And this just goes on and on. By age two, they should be doing X, Y, Z. By age three, they should be doing some meeting some other milestones. So um, it's very, very um, categorized by age. Our school system works the same way with the grade levels and the age levels. So any kid who really falls outside the average can be at risk for anxiety. So just like children on the left side of the bell curve, children on the right side and that little, little orange uh, side that I showed you guys also have differences and special needs. They may have unusual abstract reasoning, but that also makes them more emotional, more sensitive, and just more, more of everything. And the greater, the more they're different, the more they're far away from that middle of the bell curve, the harder it is for them, the harder, harder it is for them to function and feel like they fit in. So why did all of this matter? So many of the problems faced by this population can be traced back to a lack of acceptance, understanding, and just general awareness of the differences that are inherent in being developmentally on either side of the bell curve. This is really who these kids are, not what they choose to be. So our schools, our mosques need to become safe places where individual differences are nurtured and appreciated. So how does all of this tie in with anxiety? Very, very high giftedness, uh, having sort of not the 130 IQ, but way beyond that optimal IQ um, can coexist with many other conditions. It can coexist with some other disabilities like writing disabilities, reading disabilities, fine and gross uh, motor coordination skills, ADHD, even autism spectrum disorder, and anxiety, generalized anxiety, social anxiety, all kinds of anxieties and worries, and sensory processing disorder and more. There's a whole slew of alphabets you can attach to that. But sensory processing is some of the most uh, common ones. So I wanted to take some time to talk about what sensory processing is. So this refers to the way our brain perceives uh, the signals that come in through our eyes or our ears, through our five senses, or even our sense of smell. So what happens with these kids, the signals that come through are quite enhanced. So they may not be able to tolerate loud noises or even very bright lights or 
fluorescent lights. And these, most of, most people don't have trouble. Uh, you know, they wouldn't find those noises loud or, the, or those lights too bright. These are often the kids who will say, oh, the tags in their shirt are itchy, where most kids may not even uh, feel those. So they're just very, very highly sensitive. They don't only think differently, they also feel differently and that's what makes their experiences qualitatively different from the norm they're just too everything so they're too intense too honest um too idealistic too moral too per perfectionistic they're basically too much for most people and that's where the name of my business came in just a side tidbit too much mama so that's uh, where it came from so we often hear, or these kids will often hear, so this is where you can probably start relating to it a little bit more. They'll hear, why do you make everything so complicated? Why do you take everything so seriously? Why is everything even important, so important to you? Or you're too sensitive, emotional, or insert any adjective of your choice uh, there. And when they're put in academic or social situations, they may feel out of place and different. The greater that difference, the greater the struggle. And this can sometimes begin to look like social anxiety because these children are not interacting with others and experiencing world in the same way. A lot of times they'll talk and they won't realize when they're really, really young, they won't realize that nobody, none of their peers understand any of what they're saying. And that creates a social disconnect. So it starts looking like social anxiety. It can even lead to actual social anxiety if we're not careful about changing their environment or uh, working with them and learning some coping skills. So anxiety isn't just for gifted people. If, you're, if you've tuned in uh, for this talk, you know uh, that being gifted is just something on the IQ. It doesn't make anybody better or worse, it just means that their experience is different from the norm. But if you or your child have ever experienced anxiety, it is pretty normal. I wanted to take a moment to talk about this because we know that anxiety rates in children are rising, especially as we find ourselves in the middle of this pandemic, but even before this pandemic. So the stats you see on the screen are taken from a, a book called Free to Learn by Peter Gray. And he talks about the importance of children learning through play and just basically being able to play freely when they're young. Um, what he also talks about is anxiety levels back in 1948. This was a research study that was done with 14 to 16 year olds, so teens, and then it was done again in 1989. If you just look at that first thing uh, on the top, I wake up fresh and rested most mornings. It was about 75% of uh, 14 to 16 year olds who agreed with that statement back in 1948. 1989, it was about one third. If you look at some of the other ones, such as life is a strain for me much of the time, or I have certainly had more than my share of things to worry about. I'm afraid of losing my mind, things like that. You will see they're also a lot higher in 1989 than they were back in 1948. And what we also find now, that was 1989, it's 2020 now, we know for the fact that anxiety levels are only rising, not decreasing. And we see this as we see that kids have decreased opportunities for free play and decreased opportunities for being outdoors, even connecting with uh, nature. And this has coincided with having more and more hours of the day being spent at school and being spent in other adult directed activities. So children are increasingly feeling overwhelmed. Um, also, now we know with COVID and being in the midst of a pandemic, more anxiety in children is showing up. More and more people are asking for therapists for themselves and for their kids. So anxiety is becoming a lot more of a common household issue than it once was. Yeah, some simple things like wearing a mask may be difficult for some children and may be anxiety inducing. Having maybe dealing with sick parents or grandparents at this time may be difficult as well. Also changed socialization. So what I mean by that is when everybody you're socializing with, let's say if I wear a mask, you can't tell if I'm smiling or I'm stern. So kids are not able to learn through looking at people's facial expressions in a lot of settings um, during this pandemic. And that impacts their ability to communicate effectively as well. Back to school or being back to school today looks very, very different than it once did. So anxiety can happen to anybody, really. 
So now I wanted to talk a little bit, bit about what does anxiety look like? So remember how I said in the very beginning, what, what happens is that our kids usually don't come to us saying, oh, I'm feeling worried or I'm feeling anxious. Even as adults, we sometimes don't recognize that in ourselves. So what anxiety can look like is what you see on the top. So this, uh, this picture that you see here, it looks like an iceberg. It's called the anxiety iceberg. And this has really helped me in our home understand what may be happening. So what you see on the top is behavior. So you may see anger, you may see a child who has trouble focusing on schoolwork or even in sports and in other things. You may have sleep issues. So a child has trouble staying asleep or even falling asleep. Uh, they, there just may be a lot of negativity on the top. What you may also notice is defiance or oppositional behavior that can sometimes look like a behavioral problem, but it most certainly is not because what's happening at the bottom, that's the bottom layer of the iceberg that you see on the screen where it says anxiety in big letters. So these are the feelings that are happening at the bottom when you, you see one of those behaviors. So what, you are, what you're seeing there is a kid, kids could have feelings of being helpless, feeling helpless, feeling hurt, feeling insecure, even grief. So feeling sad or lonely, feeling overwhelmed, uh, feeling embarrassed, even disrespected. And all of these feelings, all these negative feelings are pooling together. But what we see, we don't see those feelings. Our kids are not always able to articulate those feelings, especially when they're very young. The kid is not going to come and tell you, oh, I'm feeling rejected or offended or, you know, one of those big feeling words. Uh, they're not going to come and tell you that. So what they see, they tell us how they can and we see it in their behavior. So what will you see on the outside? And you may already be experienced with this if you're listening to this talk. So they may cry or they may even show some anger. It may seem again like a behavioral problem, which it is not. Uh, they may also be inconsolable. They may draw inwards or, or even just shut down or alternatively, they may express themselves in what we consider to be socially inappropriate ways. And you can already start to see how this can have a huge potential to be misunderstood if we don't help them with those coping skills that will, help, that will help them deal with those feelings at the bottom. So you don't see as much of those behaviors that you see on the top. So again, this is what's happening in the brain and also eight ways a child's anxiety can show up as something else. They, I covered most of this already. Uh, inshallah, I can talk more about this in the Q&A as well. So I wanted to move on now, what's happening in our brain? Basically what's happening is an amygdala hijack. So what's happening, amygdala is, an, uh, is the emotional center of the brain. It's a small almond uh, shaped center at the back of the brain. And basically it encodes emotional messages for long-term storage in the brain. When we're feeling upset or when we perceive a threat, basically that's when kids or adults can feel anxious or worried when they perceive a threat. Now this threat may not be real for us. A kid may experience a threat that we know is not real. They may be afraid of something like heights or, or even social anxiety. The threat is not actually a threat, but to the child, this is very, very real. So what they need in that moment, I will talk about this more um, in detail as well, but what they need in that moment is just validation that yes, their feelings are real for them because to them, they're very real feelings. But what happens is the amygdala goes into fight or flight. We have stress hormones released, cortisol gets released. We have other stress hormones getting released that cause the kids or adults to start using what we call the downstairs part of the brain. And this is terminology that we can use with kids that I have used with kids as well. So you can remind them that they need to be using the upstairs part of their brain and that's what brings me to the prefrontal cortex that's right here at the front and this is used for executive functioning and planning skills and basically this is the thinking brain or the thinking part of our brain for kids we can call this the upstairs brain and this the downstairs brain even kids as young as five can understand that terminology and you can remind them that it's their amygdala that's taking control putting them, them in this fight or flight mode. So they perceive some kind of danger. That's when they start feeling worried or anxious. That's when you see those behaviors. And what's happening in the background is that the child feels that they need to either fight this threat or flight or run away from the threat. 
So that's what's happening in the background. And that's when you see the anger and the sleep issues and a lot of those other things that we uh, just talked about. So um, what happens next is now where do we go from here? So if you're just learning or you've probably already, you'll probably already know you have an anxious child, maybe you have anxiety yourself, it could be your child has other diagnosis, whether they have an actual diagnosis or uh, not, you may be feeling some feelings of grief. So, you know, the five stages of grief, you may, the first thing that most people go through is feeling shock, feeling sadness, um, even denial or anger, why is this happening? But we know we believe in something greater because we believe in Allah's plan for us. So I'll touch on that a little bit more later. Finally, you end up with resignation of the fact that yes, you have an issue or you have a struggle or a challenge at hand, then you go into acceptance and eventually you pull yourself together and you try to figure out what to do. So if you're going through any of these feelings, it's perfectly normal. I'm going to pull something here that I have. Give me a minute. So there was a study and there's been several studies done on um, this fact, but basically I wanted to pull out so I don't make this up, but basically what it says is that it looked at mothers of uh, children and parents of children with autism spectrum disorder and it looked at the their stress levels. So the chronic stress levels of parents uh, of children uh, with any of these disabilities is similar to those of parents um, of parents uh, who have children with cancer or even stress levels that combat soldiers go through, Holocaust survivors and individuals with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. They saw similar stress level in parents of uh, children. And this was very eye-opening for me when I saw this. So if you're feeling stressed out and, and you're in such a situation, I just wanted to take a moment to say that it's perfectly normal. Um, as well. What they noticed is specifically in mothers of children who are going through some of these challenges is that there's also not just uh, the psychological component of stress, but there's actual phys physiological and biological responses in the body from uh, stress. So the first piece is going through that grief, recognizing that yes, you may be feeling grief and then accepting it. And then obviously believing in the power of dua because uh, the dua can really not, it may not, uh, you know, your child's diagnosis or their abilities may not change when you make dua, but what happens when you make dua, definitely your perspective changes and things become easier. So really believing in the power of dua, calling out to Allah with his 99 uh, names, inshallah. And also again, believing in the power of Allah's plan for you and your child. So before I get into, you know, sort of the tools, strategies, and resources that have worked for us, I couldn't uh, sort of miss the biggest tool, and that is uh, the power of Quran as well as Dua. And so I alluded to that already, but I wanted to take a moment to say, if Allah has tested you with some of these challenges, first of all, he knows you're capable uh, of this. Also, la yukallifu allaha nafsan illa wusaha. Allah does not burden a soul more than it can bear. And Allah has a plan for you and your child. Allah has a plan for you and your child that you may not see today. You certainly don't see it today. What you also don't see today, and this is most important, that Allah has a reward for you that you cannot see today. So I wanted to talk about this ayah uh, from Surah Sajda, where Allah tells us that he has hidden a reward for those who leave their beds to pray at night. So bear with me for a second. Why am I talking about prayer at night and anxiety at the same time? But basically, they pray, these people leave their beds, they pray uh, at night, and they do a hidden good deed. So is your test hidden from Allah? Uh, I want you to think about that. Who's your test uh, hidden from? Especially if you have a child that's dealing with an invisible disability or a disability that people cannot see. It's not a physical disability that people can see, uh, alhamdulillah, but being invisible, having uh, an invisible dis disability is carries some tests of its own. It means that people will usually tell you that it's all in your head. It's all there, there's no problem. It's just in your head. Uh, when you have these invisible struggles, they are visible to Allah. They may be invisible to people, but they are visible to Allah. So our reward is also hidden with Allah. And when something is hidden, it's, it's even greater. So inshallah, believe, always believe in that reward. This is a reminder for myself uh, first, alhamdulillah. 
Also, again, dua will help you and your child. So teaching your child, children some duas uh, that can help them when they're feeling anxious. Also ourselves, there's a dua we're all supposed to recite in the morning and uh, evenings. I didn't put it on the slide there. Uh, we don't have enough time, but inshallah, I will say it quickly. Um, and then you can help your children learn part of it as well. So it's Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazani wa'udhu bika min al-ajzi wal-kasali wa'udhu bika min al-bukhli wal-jubni wa'udhu bika min ghalabat al-dayni wa qahr al-rijal. I mean, but basically it's a long, it's a long dua. It might be hard for uh, little kids to learn, but even if you can teach them the first part, what it means, oh Allah, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika, oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from anxiety and sorrow. That's the meaning of the first part. So inshallah, if we ask, uh, he responds. So we should never ever stop asking if we find ourselves uh, in this situation. And there were, there's so, so many stories of anxiety in the Quran and of prophets uh, suffering from anxiety in different situations and calling out to Allah and Allah shares all of this with us so we know we know what to do when we are in similar situations no one was tested uh, more than the prophets I wish I could go in detail about all these stories but I'll pick a couple just to talk about the story of Yaqub alayhi salam and his grief uh, on losing not one son but two sons and every time Yaqub alayhi salam would he would just say I am uh, you know I only complain of my grief uh, to Allah and he was he still as he grieved he still held out hope that his sons would be returned to him and uh, the story of Zakaria alayhi salam too is one where uh, you can see a balance of uh, you know grieving and hope so Zakaria alayhi salam was getting old him and his wife were getting old she was barren and they couldn't have a child and they called out to Allah Zakaria alayhi salam called out to Allah and it's beautiful uh, Allah says Fasajabna lahu, and we responded to him and Allah says this uh, in Surah Anbiya there is a section which talks about the duas of these some of these prophets and that Allah responded to each of them and Allah says um we gave him Yahya alayhi salam and we made his wife we we made the situation with his wife uh, you know he, he healed the wife so that she was able to carry the baby um, and Allah says why did he do all this this is this is the part I wanted to draw some attention to because they were they were always racing they were always running to do good uh, and they called out to Allah in hope and in fear. So what we see in Zakaria alayhi salam's story is that balance of hope and fear. We see that in Yaqub alayhi salam's story and all of these uh, prophets' uh, stories, we see that. So if you're feeling fearful, you're grieving, you just don't know what to do, your kid is experiencing some anxiety, maybe you are and maybe you've never experienced it before inshallah just remember that we need to have uh, we can have fear we can grieve but inshallah we need to keep our hope up as well because allah's help is sure to come inshallah there's other examples as, as well the story of yunus alayhi salam he was uh, when he was in the belly of the whale when he had made a mistake so if you feel you know, uh, you know if you feel that this is my fault or if you're feeling some guilt or some blame for yourself for your child's uh, struggles remember that Yunus alayhi salam was at uh, rock bottom he was in the belly of the whale when he made the dua to Allah la ilaha illa anta subhanak uh, there is no god but Allah uh, glory be to you Indeed, I was off the wrong doors. He accepted his mistake. He basically asked Allah for forgiveness. If you're feeling you're at your rock bottom, there is no way to go except upwards, inshallah. So the story of Yunus alayhi salam reminds us of that. There are other stories as well. I encourage you to look them up, inshallah. So now I will spend a couple of minutes talking about some of the tools that have helped us in our home. I won't go into too much detail for each tool, but I have put in the source for each of these tools so that you can see where I got them from. Uh, a lot of them are free tools you can uh, find online. And so this one is called Social Stories for the Anxious Child or the Anxious Parent. So this is something you can do to prepare yourself before a situation. So what we can do is as you start to go through anxiety, you learn to anticipate uh, situations where you know your child may have trouble or you may have trouble so you anticipate those situations before they occur and then you discuss and plan for them ahead of time so let's say you're going to uh, you know some place or a party that's going to be super duper loud and you know your kid has struggles with the sensory processing 
loud noises may be a problem for your kids or crowd may be a problem. And, and let's say there's gonna be a lot of sugar at this party. Yeah, I'm just making up this party. Nobody's going to a lot of parties right now uh, with the pandemic. But let's say there's this party, it's going to be very loud. There's going to be a lot of sugar. And from past experiences, you already know that that's a trigger for your child. It doesn't go well. So you talk to your child. Uh, this is a printable that you can use. I've used it myself. Uh, Alhamdulillah, talking to your kids, planning in advance always helps. So think about where you're going to be. You know, what are some situations that could upset you? You're asking this, you're asking your child this. Will there be a lot of noise, people, or activity that could possibly upset you? And ask your kid, what do you think may not go as planned or make you feel anxious while you're there? Start talking to them. And kids may not always, they're not really always able to articulate what exactly could be, uh, you know, could upset them. And that's where you can help them brainstorm uh, some uh, possible uh, you know, scenarios, what might happen? How might you feel if uh, these things happen? How do you think you might react if you get overwhelmed, angry, or anxious? So you ask your child how you think they may react. And this is giving them a chance to think about this before the fact, before it happens. Also have a plan in place. So what will you tell your parent? What are you going to tell me? Ask your child, what are you going to tell me when you start feeling overwhelmed? Do you have a signal you could work out? Maybe they could just come whisper something in your ear. They probably don't want to come to you in front of everybody and say, oh, I'm feeling anxious. Let's get out of here. Right. So what could they say to you? Uh, that's just a signal between the two of you. Is there something you could take with you that might help you feel safer and more calm? So there's a lot of sensory toys, fidget toys, uh, stress balls, squishy toys, things that kids can do, anything kids can do to keep their hands uh, busy. What my uh, kids have been staying busy with is a Rubik's cube. Even something, something that can keep your hands and your mind busy, it really helps. Do you need your uh, parents? Ask your child. Do you need your parents to take you to a private place to catch your breath? Or will a hug be enough to get you through the tough moment? Uh, also, if you're the parent, know your exit strategy, know your exit plan. Uh, do you, is, is it a situation? How do you decide that this is a situation uh, that means it's time to go? What is your exit plan? What are you going to tell yourself if you're feeling embarrassed or overwhelmed? What are you going to tell your child? What are you going to tell other onlookers, just people who happen to be there? So pre-discussing these scenarios with kids really helps. Another tool that helps is giving it a name, calling a spade a spade. So this is the unthinkables. Uh, these are just some characters that you can introduce to your kids. Not all of them. If you look through them, if you read through them, you'll know that there's some uh, that you can or your kid can relate to more than others. Uh, for us, it was rock brain who makes people get stuck on their ideas and they don't want to move from point A to point B from one to another. So we talk about how can we not let the unthinkable st uh, strike our brain and how can we be more flexible in our thinking. Glass man makes people have huge upset reactions or you may have a worry wall or worry monster monster that makes people worry too much. Grump, grump and any puts people in grumpy moods. Giving it a name takes uh, the onus away from the child. It doesn't mean they're giving up responsibility to this character. What it means is that they can say, well, I think glass man is acting on me now. And it just helps them talk, get talking about feelings and getting familiarized uh, with what might be happening in their brain. Another tool, and you may have seen this if your kids are in school, this is commonly used in schools, is the zones of regulation. I won't go into it in a lot of detail here, but basically kids learn to identify what zone they're in. Some teachers do this. They ask kids every morning, what zone are you in? It's the blue, green, yellow, or the red zone. And there's no good or bad zone, so there's no judgment here. But it is really to uh, for each zone, there are two that can help you get to a zone, a place where you're feeling calm and relaxed. So what can you do today? Let's say you walk away from here, you've seen all these tools, what do you do now? Um, you can try and I know any therapist, anybody will tell you that you should be breathing, you should try these breathing exercises, it seems so cliche, but it is true. I wanted to save it for the end, I didn't want it to be the first thing uh, I said, you know, if you have anxiety, just go breathe and that's it. You have these tools, but when, when you start to focus on your breathing as well as your kids breathing, I, we call it four, seven, eight breathing. So you're 
breathing in for four seconds, then you hold it for seven seconds and you let it out for eight seconds. I would do it with you if we had the time. Give it a name, like I said, uh, the worry monster. So you're not going to be doing all these things, going through these tools, doing the breathing while your kids are in the moment. While your kid is having that meltdown or whatever uh, they're feeling while they're in that moment, it's all about validating, validating, empathizing uh, with them. And we work on those coping skills outside the moment. So in moments when they're calm, this, this is just something you do maybe a couple times a week, maybe once a week, you just sit down and you talk about the unthinkable or the worry monster. You talk about some of uh, these things with your kid while they're calm. You also practice the breathing while they're calm because you're more likely to use the breathing skills when you're feeling anxious if you've practiced them when you're calm. Once again, what if all of this doesn't work? You shouldn't be afraid to seek professional help with a psychologist, a counselor, or a therapist. Those are some of the first people we usually go to when our kids or ourselves have uh, we have anxiety. I wanted uh, to mention another uh, thing that is occupational therapy that can be very helpful. Most people think occupational therapy is only for motor skills, uh, fine motor skills, but occupational therapy uh, can actually help kids uh, learn self-regulation and emotional regulation regulation skills as well. And remember, remember to breathe yourself. So what happens, uh, uh, you know, if we're trying to teach our kids the coping skills and they're crying or whining or being angry, that triggers parents. So what happens is if you're triggered and you're not breathing and you're not calm, uh, that's what's going to reflect in your child as well. So, uh, you know, once, when, once you're able to calm yourself down and you're breathing, you're modeling that how to be in an anxious situation for your child as well. Something else that works is just distracting them in the moment. It doesn't always work. It has it works sometimes. Just say, oh, look at look out the window. Or if you're already outside, let's look at the shapes of the clouds. What animals can you see in the shape, or what can you see in the shape? Maybe that cloud or that set of clouds uh, looks like the trees or something. So get them to focus on something else. Get them to focus on things that they can focus on using their senses. So name some things that you can see, smell, hear, maybe even taste or name five blue things that you see in this room. So giving them anything else to focus on always helps. So we talked about most of this in terms of improving coping skills, inshallah, learn brain science with your kids, give it the name, assign characters and practice being mindful at home as well as outside in nature. When you go outside in nature, that's another place where you can practice some mindfulness strategies as well. So I have put up some resources uh, for you and you can come back to this later as well. These are some resources that have helped us in our home that you can look into. Um, inshallah, I can also, if you're interested in some of them, I do have a couple of things with me here that I can share in the Q&A session as well. So that's it from me and I can take your questions now. Thank you, Sister Maliha for that very beneficial talk. I learned some great tips too for even my own social anxiety. So it was great, mashallah. Okay, so inshallah, we'll get started with the Q&A session. So any, if anyone has any questions, you can still write them in the comment section. We already have some questions, so I'll just read them out. Um, first question is, do you believe social anxiety is a learned behavior? That's a really, uh, that's a, can you still hear me? Okay, that's a really good question. Let me just share my screen again. Yeah, um, so yeah, social anxiety can be if they're feeling, uh, you know, if they're feeling anxious in social situations, if they have a sibling, an older sibling perhaps that they've seen struggle, they can definitely pick off, pick up those behaviors. Uh, it's definitely true, but you as the parent have to be able to tease it apart. Are they just, are they just, you know, learning the behaviors they've seen, maybe from an older sibling, maybe from kids in the neighborhood, friends at school, or are, are they just talking in a certain way because they've heard somebody else do it? Or are they actually struggling with the skill? It can be really difficult to tease out, but it's really up to the parent to tease it out. It can definitely be learned where they just heard somebody saying something and now they're saying it. But you need to see if they're struggling, usually if they're struggling in more than one situation, you know, if it's not something that just passes by, they said something they heard, if they're struggling, let's say at, at school, and then they're also struggling at home, let's say they're also struggling when you take them to the masjid, 
that's three different environments that they're struggling in. If they're struggling in more than one environment, uh, what we know to be true is that then likely it is there is some real anxiety behind that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll go to the next question. Um, is there a chance for the child to grow out of it? Good question. Another good question, alhamdulillah. So um, yeah, so initially when parents find out, when we find out, we think they'll grow out of it. So like I had uh, talked about my son, initially he wasn't interacting with uh, kids uh, at all when he was very little, when he was three years old. And that's what concerned uh, his preschool teacher. Um, he doesn't, you know, he, he has friends now and he interacts with kids now, alhamdulillah. So it's not the same. Uh, does he still play sports and other things? Not usually not. So he still struggles with some of it. This is not, it's not something that goes away on its own. It definitely needs some coping skills uh, to be taught. So when he was very little, the reason he wasn't playing with other kids was because uh, they just didn't understand. He tried, he tried talking to kids. He tried communicating with them, but they just didn't understand uh, what he was saying. So they would just go off and play with somebody else. That's simply what was happening. It wasn't a lot of uh, actual anxiety at that point, but if you leave that ignore for too long, it can turn into um, actual anxiety as well. So uh, it needs definitely needs coping uh, skills. It's not something they just grow out of uh, on, on their own, but it can look different at different ages. So it can look very, very different at three than it does at nine or 10, for example, but uh, definitely helping talking to them uh, and learning coping skills can help anybody, not just a child who's anxious, because all of us have, have worries and feelings from time to time. So learning coping skills can really help all of us. Okay, uh, thank you again. Okay, so next question. Um, so how do the, someone asked, how do I know if it's anxiety and not tantrums? Good question. So a tantrum versus a meltdown. I think I had that here. I didn't get into too much detail. So hold on, let me just, oh, let me put that up again. Okay, so, um, you know, I talked about this. I just had the bullet point on their meltdown versus tantrum. I didn't get into it. Uh, but a tantrum is usually, you know, for a certain thing. You're a kid, you're a very little kid, like two, three-year-old kid wants a lollipop. You say no, there's a tantrum. And that tantrum usually ends. It ends. You give them the lollipop and it ends, or you don't give them the lollipop and it continues for some time and you walk them through the feeling. They, they Either you walk them through the feeling or you get triggered as well, right? Either one, so don't get triggered. You walk them through the feeling and, uh, and they're able to accept accept that. That's a tantrum. A meltdown is when nothing is helping and also there's no trigger. So it's not that they want a lollipop and now they're upset. That's not really a meltdown. A meltdown is, let's say you're at a very loud party. It's very loud. Uh, the kid now, you know, you know, you already know this struggle with something like loud noises or lights or just very big crowds. And they're basically out of control. If they're very little, they're basically out of control. Even if they're older, they just don't know what to do. They, they can't just sit and just be with themselves and be calm. They just don't know what to do. They may be running around. They may be um, just not be able to focus on any uh, one thing. So a meltdown can look very different. Also, a meltdown doesn't usually end. Let's say I give you the lollipop and now you just stop crying. A meltdown won't end. And it also will show up in many different, like I said, it would show up in many different situations. Okay. Okay, great response. Thank you. Uh, um, are there uh, any activities, someone asked, are there any activities I can partic participate in with my newborn to ensure they don't have anxiety? So um, I think anxiety and a lot of what I talked about, you know, you know, even when I talked about the bell curve, a lot of it has to do with our genetics. It's if you have if you have an anxious child and you were watching this, you're likely an anxious parent because uh, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. So we know this to be true about anxiety, about a lot of other things. If you feel uh, if you're you know, if you have a baby and you feel you have anxiety, uh, your kids may be prone uh, to it as well. Having said that, there's not uh, 
nothing you can do. It's not a life uh, sentence. And that's when those coping skills uh, come uh, into, you know, come into play. But uh, with the baby, uh, all you can do, you're not going to sit down and talk to a baby about the unthinkables or let's do our breathing exercises. So all you can do with a baby is just have a lot uh, of attachment, have a lot of cuddles, a lot of love. That's all you can do. You don't need to worry about this until um, something like this shows up and they start struggling and then you start talking to them about it. Thank you. Uh, let's, we'll do another question. Um, are there any tips, uh, so, um, any tips on making my life easier? I have a young child, eight, with anxiety and my 15 year old as well. The eight, the eight year old has a fear of new people and the 15 year old does not like being alone. Okay, so they just want tips. So I guess I would, uh, I would say and I, it depends on where you are. I wish this was a two way conversation because I don't know if my answers are helping you guys. Uh, but with the 80, I'll start with the 80 year old uh, first where there's a fear of new people, I highly uh, recommend using this. So I highly recommend using the social stories that I had talked about. Sit down with your child. Um, inshallah, don't shy away from talking about it. A lot of times we think that when we're anticipating or we're going to talk to our kids about something, it becomes real. It actually becomes a real problem. And before it was just in their head, we need to kind of get uh, over that. I had to get over that myself and uh, sit and have these discussions uh, with my son. So whether it's a fear of new people or it could be fear of, uh, you know, even things like a attending school because you may see a lot of uh, people, whatever the situation is, you can use these social stories over and over again for those situations. So let's say um, there's a fear there your kid is going to meet some new people. I'm looking at the one on the left of my screen, which is social stories for the anxious child. So, so sit down with them. Uh, think about where you're going to be. Where are they going to encounter these new people? Is it at school? Is it at perhaps an extracurricular activity, um, where, where is it? And ask them, what are some situations that could uh, upset them? Will there be a lot of people that they could feel upset or they could feel shy um, about what do what do you think might not go as planned? And try to get to the bottom of it. So what is it, what it is, just try to get to the bottom in, in the sense of what it is that's uh, preventing them from, let's say, interacting with people or feeling really, um, uh, you know, feeling like they can't speak maybe around. And I'm just assuming here. I don't know what it is uh, with the fear of new people. Is, there, is it that you, your child can't speak to them? Uh, I encourage you to connect with me, inshallah, after the fact uh, as well. If I have a bit of a two-way conversation, I might be able to answer uh, that better. Again, discuss with them how might you feel if these things happen. There's also another resource that you can use. I don't know if you can see me very well, but this is called what to do when you grumble too much. So there's a few of these here. There's a few of these books in the series. You can see them on the top here. What to do when you grumble too much, when you worry too much, when your temper uh, flares. These books are really good for talking to your eight year old, even for younger kids, I would say five to 10 year olds. Um, and there's a book in this series. I don't have it on me, um, but it's called what to do when you're feeling, when you feel too shy. So I would encourage that because that is that one is more about social anxiety and when there's a fear of people. But I'll show you or I can talk to you. So this one about grumbling too much, we have used this in our own uh, home. It talks about kids getting stuck. It shows you an obstacle course. And basically what it's telling you that life is like an obstacle course. So meeting new people is like a hurdle or it's, it's like an obstacle course and you need to jump over this hurdle. When you start using this, uh, this terminology while your kid is calm, not while they're meeting new people, but while they're calm and just at home with you and feeling safe, if you start using uh, some of this terminology, uh, you will be able, they'll be able to recognize when they find a hurdle, when they see a hurdle. And the book encourages the kids to talk about, uh, you know, to let, when you see a hurdle, if you're in an obstacle course, do you kick the hurdle? If you kick the hurdle and you get angry, you're just going to hurt your own self. What do you do? You actually jump over the hurdle. So having uh, this hurdle terminology uh, can help as well. And I'm uh, sorry for the 15 year old. I regard did they not like being alone yeah okay yeah so i would say a lot of the same terminology 
There is a resource that's for older kids, so this would be perfect for a 15 year old. And this is also on my screen, uh, the fourth bullet point here, from warrior to warrior, a guide to conquering your fears. And this one talks about all kinds of fears. It talks about being alone, also some other anxieties. Uh, usually if it's a fear of being alone, again, you can use those social stories to drill down. So it's not, you know, what you see on the surface is a fear of being alone or a fear of people, but what's happening beneath the surface is what's really causing that asking those questions again through the social stories is really going to help you drill down and don't be afraid to have even an hour long a long conversation uh, on this because it sometimes it can really help you get to the bottom of it why is why is certain thing happening okay inshallah thank you there uh, this that's all the time we have for questions so thank you, Sister Maliha, for your time, and thank you for everyone who joined us today. I'm sure everyone gained some very beneficial knowledge, inshallah. Uh, so just some announcements now for um, upcoming sessions. We have a drop point session on the essentials of executive leadership, the, uh, the psychology of management, tomorrow, September 13th at 12 p.m. EST. This is a certificate-based course. And we are on part three of this series. Tomorrow's topic is identifying behaviors and situational factors to improve your future outcomes. We also have an exciting phone halakha every Saturday where sisters can call in over the phone. And stay tuned for the next session of the Back to School series on October 11th. So you can check out more of Being Me's events at attendbm.com. So inshallah, we'll end this session with a rec recitation by Sister Ishal Chowdhury. Ishal studies at the Calgary Islamic School. She has completed a few courses from El Huda Institute and she loves volunteering in her community. Uh, Sister Ishal, please take the mic. Assalamu alaikum. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي حُسْنٍ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ By time, indeed mankind is in loss except for those who have believed and done a righteous deed and advised each other to the truth and advised each other to patience. Jazakallah.